welcome again to Hillside Community Church in Juniata. I'm glad that you're joining us as we continue our series in the book of Matthew. This is our next to last one in Matthew. We'll be starting a new series that I've been working on uh, in regards to um, some emotions that sometimes control our minds, even as believers. So uh, it should be an interesting series. We're going to look at some things like guilt and anxiety, uh, fear, and some other topics in regards to emotions. So, uh, today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 to 56, and we're going to look at the crucifixion. The title of the message is Jesus Paid It All. Jesus Paid It All. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Joey and I got our second and final COVID shots this past week. That went fairly well. Uh, so we're glad to have that done. God's been good to us here at the church. Uh, it's warming up here in Central Pennsylvania, so we're glad about that. And uh, both our children and grandchildren will be home this weekend. Uh, so we're excited to be together as a family. As a granddaughter, Brooke, who's been serving in Mexico, is home for a break before she heads back at the end of the month. So uh, God's been good. A little bit of review, we started this whole series with I Will Build My Church, and last week we were looking at the section where Jesus went to Gethsemane with his disciples. They were weary, he prayed, uh, if it possible, Lord, could take this cup from him, but not my will, but yours be done. And our application is very simply this, sometimes the will of God involves pain. And a little sticky statement at the end was when Pain disrupts your way. Trust in your Father and pray. Not my will, but yours be done. And fix your eyes upon His Son. Let's open with prayer for the day. Father, I thank you for the gift of salvation today as we look at the crucifixion. Um, Lord, it, it is absolutely overwhelming when we stop and visualize and emotionally connect with the Scripture that describes what your Son went through one of the most horrific, barbaric ways to die on a cross. And he did it so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Lord, help. I just pray the Holy Spirit helps us understand and grasp this truth and that it is truly life-changing for us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy and I occasionally go out to eat, usually when we have gift certificates. In fact, uh, I have a gift certificate for the Olive Garden that someone gave us. The nice thing about a gift certificate is that it's already paid for. So when we go to eat, we don't have to worry about paying. It's already been paid for. In fact, one time we were at the Olive Garden eating. I think we had a gift certificate as well. And when it came time to pay, the waiter said to us, uh, someone else here in the restaurant paid for your meal. You owe us nothing. We, we never figured out who it was. Um, but we didn't have to pay because someone else paid. And our title was Jesus Paid It All. We want to talk about the road to his death. We want to talk about the reality of Jesus' death. We want to talk about the reason for his death. And then sum it up with this whole concept of Jesus paying for it all. Again, we, we ended up last week when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That ends up in chapter 26, verse 45, verse 46 says, Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And so the next thing is the fact that Jesus is betrayed and then arrested. And here's what it says in Matthew 26, 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, he predicted one of them was going to betray him. He arrived, and with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs. Sent from the chief priests, not from the Roman soldiers, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. They have been looking for a way to get rid of Jesus for quite a while now. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. And when I kiss as the man arrest him, going up once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. He accepted 30, 30 silver coins in order to turn Jesus over. You say, why didn't they just arrest him? Because doing so in public with so many people who were supporting him wasn't going to work. So they needed to do this in private. And Judas agreed to betray him. Again, kissing uh, was usually on the cheek. It was part of the culture in that day. 
Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized him, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for a sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. We know from the other Gospels it was Peter. We also know he wasn't very good with a sword. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. But then how then will the scripture be fulfilled? Let's say it must happen in this way. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. This has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Notice, all his disciples deserted him and fled. In the next verse, we talk about the fact he was taken before the Sanhedrin. This was a group of Jewish leaders, 70 in all, who had been out to get rid of Jesus all along. Verse 57 says, Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, who were the teachers of the law and the elders of the assembly. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. And the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forth. And one of the Ten Commandments is do not give false testimony. They were looking for false testimony in order to convict Jesus. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. And then the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Keep in mind, this is Thursday night. He had the Passover meal with his disciples. He washed their feet. He went to the Gethsemane about midnight. He was taken captive. Now he's before these Sanhedrin during the late hours of the night into the early morning. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He's spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He's worthy, worthy of death, they answered. And they, no. Verse 67, they spit in his face. And they struck him with their fists. And others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? This was just the beginning of our babe treatment. Next, see, Peter disowned Jesus. Now, we're pretty hard on Peter for this, but the truth is, none of the other disciples even got this close. Peter had said he would never deny the Lord, and Jesus said, yes, you will. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, I was standing there, went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Luke says, Jesus turned and looked at him. And if you remember from the Passion of the Christ, he was looking at Peter. Before the rooster crows, he will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Early next morning, verse 20, chapter 27, which begins with the fact that Judas, who betrayed him, felt remorse and hung himself. All the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put him to death, bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, received with remorse and returned 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, but I betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So he threw the money into the temple and left. He went away and hanged himself. They picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put it into the treasury since it's blood money. They decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for the foreigners. That is why it's been called the field of blood to this day. Now what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field 
as the Lord commanded hundreds of years in advance, this specific detail was prophesied. Jesus before Pilate. Again, Romans put Pilate there as the governor. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, as bad as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer, and Pilate asked him, Don't you hear how many things they're accusing you of? Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked him, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Christ? For he knew it was out of envy they had handed Jesus over to them. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. So when he asked again, they said, Barabbas. What shall I do then with Jesus, who's called the Christ? They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? But they shouted all louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands, said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. And the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. And he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged handed him over to be crucified. Verse 27, the soldiers mocked Jesus. The governor's soldiers took him into the praetorium and gathered a whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and wove a crown of thorns, set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and they took the staff and struck him in the head again and again. And after they mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him. They led him away to crucify him. That's the robe Jesus took to the cross. The reality of his death in chapter 27, verses 32 to 56. You see, we're going to look at this uh, because some people say Jesus didn't die. I'll put a picture on the screen of him on the cross. Here's what it says. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. Keep in mind, he was flogged. We'll look at that in detail a little bit. But he had, if you watch the Passion of the Christ, you saw the physical toll a beating like that could take on a person. So Jesus couldn't carry the cross beam to the cross, to his crucifixion site. So they, a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him. Again, that was predicted in the Old Testament as well. And above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on the left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers, the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. We'll believe in him. He could have done that. But then our sins would have not been paid for. He trusts in God. Let him rescue him now if he wants to. For he said, I'm the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour till the ninth hour, from noon till three o'clock, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, in Gethsemane, why I was under so emotional distress it wasn't just the fact of the physical pain. It was the fact that he would be abandoned by his father. He would carry the weight of the sin of the world. When some of those standing there heard this, they said he's calling Eli. They misunderstood what he was saying. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge filled with wine, vinegar, put it on a stick, offered it to Jesus. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. When he cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Earth shook, rocks split, the 
tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with them were regarding Jesus saw the earthquake, all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely, surely, he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Jesus had predicted his death and predicted his resurrection. His disciples did not get it. Luke says, the Son of Man must suffer. Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Again, some people said he didn't really die. He just swooned. It was first recorded in the Quran in the 7th century. He revived in the coolness of the temple, of the grave, got up, rolled away the stone, beat down the soldiers, and fled to India. Some people said he just fainted. Some said he was given a drug to simulate death. In 1982, the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the writer said Pontius Pilate was bribed to take Jesus down before he died. You know, the most accurate description of, of death by crucifixion I've ever read was written by Alexander Methrow. It's in the book, The Case for Christ, written by Lee Strobel. Listen to this description. First of all, he says flogging. Roman floggings were known to be terribly brutal. They usually consisted of 39 lashes, but sometimes more, depending on the attitude of the soldier that day. The soldier would use a whip braided with leather thongs with metal balls woven into them. When those metal balls hit the back, they would cause deep bruising and contusions, which would break open with further blows. They also had pieces of sharp bone tied into that, which would rip the skin. It went from the top of his back all the way down to the back of the person's legs. We know many people would die from that before they would even be crucified. At the least, the victim would experience tremendous pain and go into what was called hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock means a person was suffering the effects of losing a large amount of blood. This does four things. First, the heart races to try to pump blood that isn't there. Second, the blood pressure drops, causing fainting. Third, the kidneys stop producing. And fourth, the person becomes very thirsty as the body craves fluid to replace the lost blood volume. Jesus was in hypovolemic shock as he headed off to the cross. That's why he couldn't carry the cross beam. Finally, he collapsed. And Simon was ordered to carry the cross for him. Later, we read Jesus saying, I thirst, again, a result from his beating. When he arrived at the site of the crucifixion, he would have been laid down. His hands would have been nailed in the outstretched position to the horizontal beam. Romans used spikes five to seven to nine inches in length. The nails went through his wrist, not his hands. In his hands, they would have torn, he would have fallen off the cross. In that day, the wrist was considered part of the hand. That was a position that would lock his hands in place. So the nails went through the wrists. At this point, Jesus was hoisted as the crossbar was attached to the vertical stake, which was already in the ground. Then nails were driven through his feet. His arms would have been immediately stretched, probably about six inches in length. Both shoulders would have become dislocated. This fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy in Psalm 22, which said, My bones are out of joint. At this point, once a person is hanging in that vertical position, crucifixion is essentially an agonizingly slow death by asphyxiation. The reason is the stresses on the muscles in the diaphragm put the chest in the inhaled position. Basically, in order to exhale, you have to push up from below. In doing so, the nails would tear through the foot, eventually locking up against the tarsal bone. After managing to exhale, the person would then be able to relax down and take another breath. Again, he'd have to push up to exhale, scraping his back against the coarse wood of the cross. This would go on and on until complete exhaustion would take over and the person wouldn't be able to push up and breathe. And the person slows down his breathing, he goes into what's called the respiratory acidosis. The carbon dioxide in the blood is dissolved as carbonic acid causes the acidity of the blood to increase. Eventually this leads to irregular heartbeat. And 
fact, the heart of Jesus was beating erratically. He would have known he was about to die. That's why he was able to say, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died of cardiac arrest after six painful agony hours on the cross. But even before he died, hypodermic shock would have caused a sustained rapid heart rate that would have contributed to heart failure, resulting in the collection of fluid in the membrane around his heart called a pericardial effusion, as well as around the lungs, called a pleural effusion. Why is that significant? Because when the soldier went to make sure Jesus was dead, he thought he was dead, but he stuck his spear through his ribs. Out came this fluid around the heart and the lungs, plus a large amount of blood. No, he didn't swoon. He didn't faint. He was dead. Roman soldiers who had watched him die knew what death was all about. Knew he had died. The road to the cross was painful. The reality of his cross was for sure. But here's the issue. The reason for the cross. Why the reason? We're going to put different scriptures up on the screen. I'm going to start in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says this. For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Peter wrote this. The Peter who was there denied the Lord three times. When he writes his book, realizes Christ also died for sins, once for all. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were given over and over and over. Jesus only had to die one time, the perfect sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. Notice, in order that he might bring us to God. Hebrews points out the fact that we have a high priest who can identify with what we've gone through, but he was without sin. God's perfect sacrifice, because a holy God required a perfect sacrifice. There was no other sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we'll put it on the screen. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. The big word is justification. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God stamps you righteous. Why? Not on your goodness, because Jesus Christ, God's Son, paid the penalty. Jesus paid it all for you. And you get to be declared righteous, therefore ready for heaven. And God sees you as a righteously clean person. You see, we'll put Romans 3 up, 23. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reason why we all have a sin nature is because in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, says, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Because if Adam chose to sin, Death fell upon all of us. We're born with a sin nature. If you're honest with yourself, you know that. That's why Romans can say all have sinned. Fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He points out the fact that someone might die for a good person, but nobody's going to die for a sinner. But Jesus died for us when we were sinners. The most famous verses in the Bible. John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What was the reason for the cross? Because that's the only way the penalty for your sins and my sins could be paid. God did not send His Son in the world to judge the world. The world should be saved through Him. Jesus said that to Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night, and wanted to know what He had to do to be saved. John the Baptist saw Jesus in John 1, 29. He said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why the cross. The Old Testament sacrifice of a pure lamb without blemish. We had a perfect Lamb of God on the cross to die. Pay the penalty for your sins and my sins. John 19.30. John records the fact that Jesus said, It is finished. And underneath that, the Greek word, to telestai. The Greek word meaning, it is completed, it's finished, and the results remain. Jesus paid it all. I read about a very unusual wedding banquet a number of years ago. In 1990, the Boston Globe ran the account of this wedding banquet. Accompanied by her fiance, a woman went to the Hyde Hotel in downtown Boston and ordered the meal. They had they poured over all kinds of the menu made stuck some china and silver, pointed to pictures of flower arrangements they liked. They both had very expensive taste, and the bill came $13,000. After leaving a check for half that amount, 
They went home to flip through the book of wedding announcements. The day the announcement was supposed to be mailed, the groom got some cold feet and he said, you know what, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. When his angry fiance returned to the hive to cancel the banquet, the events manager had sympathy. She said, you know what, the same thing happened to me. But she said about the refund, I got bad news. You only get back $1,300. So you can lose the rest of the money or you can go ahead with the banquet. It seemed crazy, but the more the jilted bride thought about it, the more she liked the idea of going ahead with the party. Not a wedding banquet, mind you, but a big blowout. See, 10 years earlier, she'd been a homeless person. She'd gotten herself back together. She'd gotten a good job. She saved up a nice nest egg of money. And so she decided to throw a party for all the down and outers in Boston. And so it was that day in June 1990, the Hyde Hotel in downtown Boston hosted a party like it had never seen before. She did change the menu to boneless chicken in honor of the groom. And she sent invitations to rescue missions and homeless shelters. That summer night, people who were used to eating peeled pizza off of cardboard boxes out of dumpsters instead dined on chicken cordon bleu. Hyatt waiters and tuxedos served hors d'oeuvres to senior citizens propped up by crutches and aluminum walkers. Bag ladies, vagrants, and addicts took one night off from the hard life. Instead, sipped champagne, ate chocolate, wedding cake, and danced to big band melodies late into the night. And you know what? Every single one got in for free because someone paid for it all. See, in order to have Christ's forgiveness and experience eternal life, you must be willing to repent. Jesus Christ went to the cross and went to a horrific, barbaric execution to pay the penalty for your sins in my sins. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, it's the most important decision you will ever make. It gives you purpose in this life and gives you eternal life. And, and if you have any issue at all, you realize how quickly this life passes. Paul said, if I only have hope in Christ in this life, pity me. But he said, I have hope beyond this life. It's because Jesus Christ died and then was raised again. So let me just point it out very simply. A, admit the fact. Admit your need. Romans said, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Admit the fact that you're a sinner. Just be honest with the Lord. Be honest with yourself. Lord, I have sinned against you. Believe. Jesus Christ died and rose. The word believe means to put your trust in. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says it's not by works. See, most people think if they do enough good works, they can earn their ways. I do things to earn my way. But biblical Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. It's done. Jesus paid for it. It was done on the cross with the resurrection of him. And see, make a choice. Choose to invite Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Savior and Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I made that commitment to Christ when I was eight years old. It's never too late. You see, one of those thieves on the cross began to have a change of heart when he was there. It's never too late. Jesus paid it all. We saw the road he took to the cross. We saw the reality of the fact that he died. We saw the reason for his death. The reason for his death was to pay the penalty for your sins and for my sins. When I was growing up, our church sang mostly hymns. And one of the hymns we sang was a hymn called Jesus Paid It All. It was originally written by Elvina Hall. Alvina Hall was a woman who attended the church in Baltimore, Maryland. And one day the pastor was praying a rather long prayer, and she was sitting in the choir loft. And her mind turned to our need for salvation and the price Jesus paid. And so all of a sudden words began coming to her mind, and she didn't have any papers, so she wrote in the flyleaf of her hymn book these words. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. After the service, she gave the words to her pastor. But there was an extraordinary coincidence that took place because just a few days before that, 
organist John Green had written a new tune and given it to the pastor. When the pastor checked the lyrics she'd written with a tune the organist gave him, he noticed how well they fit together. So he put them together, and that's how we got the hymn, Jesus Paid It All. Because no one else could pay. Now, recently, the newsboys took that old hymn and redid it and added some words to it. And because of copyright issues, I can't actually play it here for you. But we're going to put a note at the end of the series, at the end of the message today, to tell you where you can find that song. I encourage you to listen to that song. Jesus paid it all. Why the cross? Why the pain? Why the agony? Why the suffering? Why the mocking? Why being spit on? Why being beat? Why a crown of thorns? Philippians chapter 2 says we have to have the same mind in us which is in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, was willing to become human. And not just become human, but then to die. And not just to die, but to die the most horrific death possible on the cross. Mocked, beaten. He could have had 12 angels of angels come and rescue him. But he stayed on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and my sins. Jesus paid it all. If you've never accepted him as your personal Savior, please, please, seriously. Realize he died to pay the penalty for your sins and give you life eternal. Let's pray. Father God, it, it, it is mind-boggling to me uh, to realize the price you paid to save sinners like us. Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Thank you for the fact that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Lord, help all of us to realize what he paid and respond to that by giving our all to him. I pray these things in Jesus.